Okay, well, uh, welcome to Church at Home this Sunday. Um, my name is Pastor Kylie, and as you can tell, we're doing things a little bit differently. Uh, if you've watched any of our other YouTube videos, uh, you may be used to seeing us um, up on the stage preaching, but um, this Sunday we're just going to try something a little bit different, so let us know what you think in the comments, uh, if you like this version or if you prefer us up on the stage. Um, so yeah, let's get to it. This morning we are starting our Advent series, and we're calling it Clickbait Christmas. And basically the idea behind that title is that if Jesus had been alive today, uh, he would have his story would have made the news. I mean, it would have been on every tabloid in America. It would have been, um, there would have been just clickbait links about it. There would have been all of these different news uh, sites that have, would have just been proclaiming everything about it because his story was a big deal. And sometimes I think that we forget in the hustle and bustle of Christmas and in these traditions and these stories that maybe feel really familiar to us because um, we've been hearing them for a long time. Uh, I think sometimes we forget just how scandalous Jesus' story really was. Um, and so that's kind of what we're going to be looking at in this series is this clickbait Christmas series of how scandalous Jesus' story really was. Um, so I want to just start off with a story. Uh, first off with a question. And that question is, what defines you? Um, I think for a lot of us, the answer to that would be our family history, our family tree. Uh, whether we want to or not, whether we're proud of where we came from, uh, or whether we want to move across the country and change our name, um, our families really can define us. Um, in fact, when I was growing up, uh, I had this awesome family story that I just loved hearing. Um, and it was a story about a man named Pancrotchus Warmerdam. <laughs> How's that for a name, right? Um, but anyway, Pancrotchus, he, um, he lived in the Netherlands, and all his life he grew up wanting to be a cowboy. He had heard about cowboys in America, and that was his goal, that was his dream, was to be a cowboy. Uh, so when he was old enough, he didn't really have enough money to afford a ticket over to America, but he struck a deal with a captain of a ship, and he said, listen, I'll work for free if when we get to America, you let me get off. And the captain said, all right, free labor, I'll take that. Um, and so he got on board with this captain, and he thought that the captain was honest, but it turns out uh, the captain was actually lying to him. Um, instead of taking him to America, he took him to Africa and then back up to the Netherlands. Um, so Pankatras got off. He was really disappointed, and um, he went and found another captain, and that captain did the same thing to him. And eventually, I think that happened to him like six or seven times, where he kept being lied to by all these ship's captains. And then finally, he found an honest, good captain who kept his word, who took him to America, um, let him get off, at Ellis Island, but instead of going through Ellis Island, Pancratius actually snuck around the island um, and went into the heart of New York, um, but not knowing any English, this is my favorite part of the story, not knowing any English, he had trouble ordering at restaurants, like getting food and stuff, so, um, so he went to this restaurant and he sat down next to a guy, um, and that guy ordered apple pie and coffee. And so the story kind of varies. Some people say for just a couple days, some people say for like a couple of months. Um, but for this next period of time, the only words in the English language that Pancratius knew were apple pie and coffee. <laughs> and so um, that's what he ate. That's what he ordered anytime he went to a restaurant because that's all he knew how to order. Um, and so, you know, because of that story, I've always loved apple pie. I've always been really proud um, of my Dutch heritage. I've always um, just been fascinated by the Netherlands. I've always wanted to go, even though I've never been over there. Uh, this story, this family history, has kind of defined a part of who I am, right? Because stories, family histories, can really define us. They can really... Um, kind of set a path for our lives. Like I said, whether we're proud of that fact or whether we want to run from that fact, either way, they can kind of just catapult where our lives go. And that's why I find it so interesting that the only person in all of human history who could choose who his family would be 
chose one of the most embarrassing, scandalous families he could have possibly chosen. Okay, so if you want to follow along in your Bibles, we're going to be mostly in Matthew 1. But our bottom line for this morning is that God can use broken, redeemed, and ostracized people for his glory. Okay, so in Matthew 1, you may be a little bit nervous if you've, if you've turned there already and you've seen that it just starts as a genealogy, just a list of names, <laughs> right? I mean, we've got Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac was the father of Jacob, and it just keeps going like that for like 16 verses. Um, but don't worry, we're not going to read all of that. We're just going to pull out a couple of names. Um, and the first name that I want to bring to your attention is found in Matthew uh, 1 verse 10. Um, and that is the name Manasseh. So the verse actually reads, Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, Manasseh the father of Amon, Amon the father of Josiah. Uh, but we want to focus on Man Manasseh, right? Because he's not really a name that you probably heard about in Sunday school. Um, you know, he's not really a name that we like to talk about on Sunday mornings. Um, and let me just sum up his story for you because it is a crazy one. Um, so his story is actually found in 1 Kings chapter 21, if you want to go read that later. It's 1 Kings 21. Um, this is just a summary of it. It says, He, meaning Manasseh, did evil in the eyes of the Lord, following the detestable practices of the nations that the Lord had driven out before the Israelites. He sacrificed his own son in the fire. He practiced divination, saw omens, and consulted mediums and spiritists. He did much evil in the eyes of the Lord, arousing his anger. Okay, and then God warned the Israelites that he wasn't happy and that discipline was coming. But the, it, the people, the Israelites, did not listen. Manasseh led them astray so that they did more evil than the nations the Lord had destroyed before the Israelites. Moreover, Manasseh also shed so much innocent blood that he filled Jerusalem from end to end. Besides the sin that he had caused Judah to commit, so that they also did evil in the eyes of the Lord. This man is in the family tree of Jesus. I think that we can all agree that no matter who we're related to, at least it's not this guy, right? I think very few people would want to claim Manasseh as their great, 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 whatever, however many greats, grandpa. And yet that's exactly what God did when he put him in Jesus' family tree. He chose this man to be a part of the family tree of Jesus the Messiah. Why would God do something like that? Right? Why would God allow this evil man to be a part of Jesus' family tree? I think the reality is that it is easy to look at our world today and see evil people. I mean, sometimes it can be hard to have faith in such a broken world because all we see around us is division and anger, immorality, all of these different things that can make it hard for us to have faith because we can look around and we can say, God, if you're real, if you're powerful, and if you're good, why would you allow this to happen? And you can fill in that blank with whatever you want. You can fill it in with something that happened in your personal life, something that maybe is happening in the nation right now, something that's happening around the world that just breaks your heart. Whatever that thing is, it can be easy to look at that thing and say, God, if you are so good, why did you allow this to happen? And I think what God is saying through the story of Manasseh and through including Manasseh in Jesus' family tree is that he is in the business of redeeming broken people. He can use broken people for his glory. And here's the beautiful part. Even when those people don't want to be used for God's glory, God is still in the business of using broken people for his glory right? Because looking in hindsight, I'm sure there were people in Manasseh's day who looked around and they said, God, if you're so good, why is this man in charge? If you're so good, then why is a murderer the leader of your people? 
And yet looking in hindsight, we can see that God was setting Manasseh up to be a part of this family tree of Jesus. And so in hindsight, we can kind of see a little bit of God's plan, right? Because we don't always know the full story, but God does. And so that's our first, our first point today, that God can use broken people for his glory. And if you've been discouraged by some of the evil in the world or by the evil of the people around you, just know that there are things going on in the background that you may not know about, but that God is using to fulfill his story, right? Because God has the power to redeem any situation. But the beautiful thing is, even though Manasseh never admitted that what he was doing was wrong, even though he never had this repentance story, right? God still used him. But the beautiful thing is that when we come to God and when we admit that we are sinners and we need God's um, grace to just fill our lives, he, then he doesn't have to wait generations to bring about the goodness, but he can actually redeem our situation right now. And we see that in another one of Jesus' great, great ancestors. We see that in the story of King David, right? Because in Matthew 1, 6, it says that King David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife, right? So David is listed in the family tree of Jesus. And what I love about the way Matthew writes is that he's not listing any of the good things that David did, right? During David's time, Israel was at its peak. It was at its golden age during David and Solomon's time, right? And so future Israelites, or I guess past Israelites now, they would look back at King David and say, man, those were the good old days. And Matthew could have referenced any of those good things that David did. But instead, he reminds us that the father, the mother of Solomon had been Uriah's wife. And a good Jew living in the time that Matthew was written, they would have known exactly what that story was referencing. But if you're not familiar with your Old Testament history, I'm just going to summarize the story for you. Okay, so basically, um, David, he decided to stay at home one spring instead of going out to war with his men, with his soldiers. Okay, so first of all, David is allowing other men to fight his battle for him. And as he's home, and he's probably bored because, you know, he's supposed to be out fighting, but he's not. So he's home, and he decides to go up on his roof one day. And when he's up on his roof, he sees this beautiful woman a few houses down who's bathing on her roof. Okay, so she's wearing less clothes than normal. She's bathing on her roof, probably trying to get away from prying eyes. <laughs> Yet here's King David up on his palace, and he's able to look down, and he's able to see Bathsheba bathing. I've always thought it was ironic that her name was Bathsheba, but anyway, that's her name. Um, so David, he likes what he sees, and he summons Bathsheba to the palace, and you know, it's argued that Bathsheba didn't really have a choice in the matter, but she comes, and um, you know, they go into David's room, and one thing leads to another, and a couple weeks later, Bathsheba finds out that she's pregnant. And this is a problem because Uriah, or Bathsheba's husband is Uriah, who's a soldier in David's army. So he's out fighting for David. And so what David does is he calls Uriah home and he says, Hey, you've been doing a really good job. I just want to reward you. Why don't you go home and spend some time with your wife? And Uriah says, How could I do that? How could I go enjoy my wife, enjoy being home when all of my men are out fighting? And so instead of going home, he spends the night on David's doorstep. <laughs> and so David said, well, that, story, that, that solution didn't really work. Um, so instead of just coming clean then about his sin, he sends Uriah back to the battlefield with a note for the commanding officer that says, put Uriah at the front lines and then draw back from him so that Uriah gets shot down and killed. And so that's exactly what the commanding officer does. He puts Uriah in the front lines. He actually does this horrible like tactical move that would put a lot of his men in danger. But the whole point of it is to get this one guy killed. Okay, so now David is not only an adulterer, but he is also responsible for the death of one of his leading commanding officers. Okay, and so David, 
he he does bring Bathsheba into his home and they do get married and he takes her as a wife. So there's a little bit of redemption there, but there's still just all of this covering up that David has tried to do and he still hasn't been confront, confronted until one day Nathan the prophet, he comes to David and he confronts him about what he's done. And instead of having a hard heart, what David does is he repents. And he comes before the Lord and he says, God, what I did was wrong. And we have some beautiful Psalms that David wrote that just remind us of how he was feeling. They're very raw, they're very real feelings that he experienced because of this um, sin that he committed and now realizes was wrong. And so he comes before the Lord and he repents. And the Lord accept his repent, accepts his repentance and he offers him forgiveness. And then out of that union between David and Bathsheba comes King Solomon, who, like I said earlier, was one of the two kings during David's or during Israel's golden age. And then out of Solomon eventually becomes comes Jesus. And that's the kind of thing that God can do with broken people who know they are broken. Right? God doesn't call us to legalism. He doesn't call us to trying to do all of the right things to please him. He just calls us to repentance. And out of that repentance comes forgiveness. And out of that forgiveness comes new life. And just like in David's life, he didn't have to wait generations to see the good that God was going to do, but he right away saw good come out of his repentance. And that's what God wants to do through each and every person who asks for repentance, who asks for forgiveness. Okay, so God can use broken people for his glory. God can use repentant people. He can redeem their situation and he can bring good out of things like that. I love what Tim Keller says. I think it perfectly sums up both the story of David and the story of Jesus or the message that Jesus brought to people. Tim Keller says this. He says, the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dare believe. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dare believe. Yet, at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. We are more flawed than we ever dare believe, yet we are more loved than we ever dare hope. And that, my friends, is the true meaning of Christmas. That right there. And that's why we celebrate Advent year after year just to celebrate that simple truth that God can redeem any situation. And I love that Bathsheba is mentioned. She's not mentioned by name, but the fact that she's referenced at all is such a beautiful uh, reminder of God's glory. And what I love even more is that Bathsheba is not the only woman mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus, in the family tree of Jesus. And what I love about the other women that are mentioned, they're not good Jewish girls. <laughs> in fact, out of the five women, three of them are not Jews. And coming from a Jewish Messiah, that's not what you would expect. First of all, in the Jewish culture, just in the culture of that time, this was a very patriarchal society. And so women weren't mentioned in the family tree because honestly, all that mattered was who your father was. So women were hardly ever mentioned in genealogies. And yet the genealogy of Jesus has five. And out of these five, three of them aren't Jews. That's not what you would expect from a Jewish Messiah. But I think what God is trying to say here is that Jesus is not just a Jewish Messiah. He came from the Jews, but he came for the world. I think that's what God is trying to say by mentioning these three women, these three other women. I mean, one of them, 
was Ruth, who was from the city of Moab, from the area of Moab, right? The Moabs were enemies of the Jewish people. They were feared by the Jews. They were hated by the Jews. They didn't worship the same God. They didn't worship Yahweh. They worshiped idols, which God says over and over again, you know, don't worship idols yet. Ruth came from this city, this area, this people that worshiped idols. She probably would have grown up worshiping idols herself or would have at least seen it on a regular basis. Okay, and then not only does he include Ruth, the Moab, but he includes Rahab, who's from the city of Jericho. I don't know if you're familiar with the song, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, but this is the same Rahab who, um, she was actually a prostitute that spies from Israel came and they met her and she hid them from her city leaders. She honestly betrayed her own city, right? Because she kind of showed Joshua and Caleb these, uh, these spies. She showed them where all the weaknesses in, in her city were. And she said, all I ask from you is that the God of your people, the God of the Jews, saves me and my family. Right, so she actually betrayed her own people because she believed in the God of the Jews. She believed in Yahweh, our God that we worship today. Right, but she would have probably had a hard time being accepted into the Jewish culture, right? Because you know how humans are. If someone looks different than us, if acts different, believes differently than us, it can be kind of hard to accept them sometimes. But what God is saying is, look, even these women who are so different from you, Jews, <laughs> Even they are a part of the family of Jesus. And then I just, I love the last woman that is mentioned before Mary. The last woman that is mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus. Her name was Tamar. Tamar's sons, their father was Tamar's father-in-law twice over. <laughs> Isn't that a story for you? I mean, Tamar, she got married to Judah's son. Judah's son was evil in the eyes of the Lord, so the Lord struck him down. And so according to both the Canaanite and the Jewish uh, culture of that day, Tamar then married um, Judah's next oldest son. And yet he refused to give her a child because he knew that that child would receive the inheritance that now should have belonged to him as the next surviving son. And so he refused to give Tamar what was rightfully hers. And so because of that, God struck him down. And then Judah began to believe that maybe Tamar was cursed because both of her husbands, Judah's oldest two sons, had died while they were married to her. And so he promises that he'll give, him, give her his oldest son when he's old enough. But when the time comes... Tamar realizes that he's not going to give him, give her that son. And so she actually disguises herself as a prostitute, goes out into the desert where she knows that Judah will be walking, and she convince, convinces Judah to sleep with her. And that is how Tamar's sons come to be. And those, those sons, Perez, one of those twin brothers that Tamar gives birth to, one of those twin brothers ends up being the great, great, great ancestor of Jesus. God, Jesus, did not just come for the Jewish people. He didn't come for just one people group. He didn't come for just good little Christians who do what they're told. He came for, from broken people, from broken stories, like the story of Tamar, like the story of Ruth and Rahab, David and Manasseh. Right, He came not just from Jews, but also from Gentiles, because he doesn't come just for one people group, but he comes for the world, no matter what that world looks like. Because God wasn't surprised when this world was broken. He wasn't surprised when Eve ate the fruit that she wasn't supposed to fruit to eat, <laughs> that she wasn't supposed to eat, and sin entered the world. That didn't surprise him, because all along he had this plan that he put in place from before Adam and Eve were even created. He had this plan of redemption for the whole world through his son, Jesus Christ. 
And I think that that is the story of Jesus' family tree. Right? The story of names that at surface level can just seem like a boring list of who beget who and who was the father, who was the son of who. But when you really dig into it, there is so much history and depth and richness to be learned. Because Jesus didn't come for the good. He didn't come for those who have it all together, but he came for people like you and, Pete and me. People who are broken. People who, you know, struggle every day sometimes just to get by. That's the people that he came from. And that's the people he came for. I don't know if you've ever felt left out. I don't know if you've ever felt like maybe you don't belong especially maybe in church. Maybe you've never even been to a church before and you're just checking out this church on YouTube for the first time. If that's you this morning, then I want you to know that what God says through his family tree is that you belong. You belong. If you're broken, if you recognize your brokenness, if maybe you don't fit in with your people, like the women that are mentioned, maybe if you don't fit in, you belong here, right? Because God is in the business of making strangers a part of his family, right? Because the story of Christmas is the story of God using scandalous stories that are full of scandalous people to demonstrate his scandalous grace. And that's why we're calling our Advent series Clickbait Christmas. Right? Because we can get so caught up in the tradition and the fuzzy, warm, fuzzy feelings that we get when we think about the little nativity scene, and we can forget that these are real stories full of real heartbreak that happen to real people. And that happened because of a real Messiah. The story of Jesus, even before his birth, is scandalous and shocking. Just like my story, and maybe just like yours too. God uses evil for good, like he did with Manasseh. If you're afraid, of what kind of evil this world is coming to. Just know that God can use evil for good like he did with Manasseh. He uses repentance to change the world like he did with King David. If you're aware of your sin, if you're so tired of just doing the same things over and over again and you don't know how to stop, just know that God can use your repentance to change your life in the lives of everyone around you. God can use repentance to change the world just like he did with David. And God brings outsiders. He brings strangers. He brings people who don't fit in. He brings them into the family. Just like he did with Ruth and Rahab and Tamar. God brings strangers into the family. So if God can do all of that with these crazy stories, my question for you is, what can God do with your story?